Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, as the Minister uh, introduced me, I'm David Kelly. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive with the Department of Building and Housing and I cover the Building Quality Branch. Um, that role focuses on uh, one of the core um, uh, roles of the Department. Uh, we administer the Building Act and the New Zealand Building Code and my role in particular focuses on where improvements need to be made to the Building Code and to the standards of New Zealand. And in that capacity, uh, my role in this investigation has to been to oversee the investigation into four key buildings that I'll come to in a, in a moment. Um, the department made the decision uh, that there were four particular buildings we should focus on in terms of this investigation. The CTV building, the Pine Gould building, which I'll ask Dr Richard Sharp to present on shortly, um, Forsyth Bar and the Hotel Grand Chancellor. Today we are releasing the report on three of those buildings, being the PGC, Forsyth Bar and Hotel Grand Chancellor. Um, the key thing for us in doing this work is understanding how buildings perform uh, and to improve quality, save lives in the future. So that's been a very clear focus. As the Minister said, there's been a very meticulous and thorough approach. We've engaged leading New Zealand uh, companies now, they're listed there, Becker Consultants, Dunning Thornton, Structure Smith and Highland Fatigue. But also critically we've had a panel of experts that's overseen that work. And it's that latter part that I just want to briefly touch on. Um, it was critical in terms of the credibility and robustness of this work that all of the work is thoroughly peer reviewed. We've got a multidisciplinary team of uh, experts headed by uh, Mr Sherwin Williams. Uh, Sherwin is the chairman of the Construction Law Society. Um, the other particular person I point out on that list is Professor Nigel Priestley. He's a former professor of structural engineering at the University of California and I think for many people he would be acknowledged as New Zealand's leading academic in terms of structural engineering. He has a very long history both in this country and all around the world internationally regarded as right up there. So he's been a critical person in terms of uh, the robustness and, uh, and I can say that having listened to a lot of the discussion and seen a lot of the offline discussion that it has been very robust in terms of making sure uh, that all of the um, ideas are tested and tested again. Um, in addition to that, Associate Professor Stefano Pampanen also has international experience, particularly in New Zealand and Italy. Dr Helen Anderson brings expertise around seismology. Helen also is the former Chief Executive of Ministry of Research, Science and Technology. Um, other members include Peter Miller. Uh, Peter is with Tonkin and Taylor, uh, New Zealand's leading geotechnical engineering consultancy. And Peter is extremely um, well regarded both nationally and internationally. Uh, Peter uh, Marshall Cook uh, particularly what was important we felt was that it isn't just around the engineering but understanding the philosophy behind the design. So getting a well respected architect who understood what was going on in terms of philosophy at the time these buildings were built. Uh, Peter Fell brings expertise in construction. George Skimming has a very long history with Wellington City Council uh, going back several decades and understands how consenting systems work and members of the individual consultancies have also been part of the panel. So the report we're releasing today covers the Pine Gould Corporation, Forsyth Bar and Hotel Grand Chancellor. The CTV building is still underway. It is an extremely complex piece of work and the very clear advice the department had from the panel of experts was that it needed some more analysis. Uh, we're, we're pleased with the progress that's been made but given that it is such a complex piece of work, their clear advice was to do some additional work and we've got that underway uh, with the intention that that will be released uh, at the end of this year or early next year. Um, just before I go into the context, I should also say uh, this morning we spoke with relatives of um, people who died in the Pine Gould Corporation building and also with tenants so that they are aware of the release of this report and um, we believe that that was really important that we did that first, uh, that they have that information before it becomes public. In terms of context, um, I think uh, 
It does need to be reiterated, not in terms of being trite, but the 22nd February earthquake was exceptional. Uh, the ground shaking exceeded not only the standards that buildings were built to at the time they were built, but they even exceed the 2010 standards. And Dr Sharp will take you through that in a bit more detail. The peak vertical accelerations in particular are amongst the highest recorded anywhere in the world. Um, and the other thing is that they were much greater than the September earthquake, also much greater than the Boxing Day earthquake that a number of people have asked us about. Uh, the outcome, it's clear, as the Minister said, that the ground shaking and vertical accelerations are a very significant prime reasons why buildings failed. Um, there are some matters of design and detailing that could be checked and improved. So while we say that this was a very exceptional earthquake, we still need to do more to dig behind that and say what can we learn because there are elements that we can still learn, both from buildings that survived and buildings that did not survive. This report is focusing on some of those that didn't survive, obviously. Uh, the department's taking immediate action on all of the expert panel recommendations. We've accepted every one of them and we're moving immediately, in particular on the stairwell advisory. Today the department has written to the chief executives of every council in New Zealand, asking them to get in contact with all of the building owners in their territory of multi-storey buildings, strongly advising that they should take immediate action to check the structural stability of their stairs, particularly uh, in relation to what we, what we call a practice advisory that's also been released today to councils, to structural engineers and other property owners and interested parties. So uh, we anticipate that they will move very quickly on this. We think it's important that they do. Um, and we've got very strong support from the engineering profession in doing this work. Uh, we will also be working very quickly on the other aspects of the recommendations of the panel uh, and we expect to be able to regularly update on where we're getting to. Uh, just finally before I introduce Dr Sharp, uh, this will be a key input in terms of technical input to the Royal Commission. Uh, that report has gone to them today and they will be making that public. It will also be on the department's website so all of the information we've got available is made available to the public um, and I think that's really important. So with that introduction could I introduce Dr Richard Sharp. Uh, Richard is uh, with Becker Consultants, he's played a key role in the Pine Gould Corporation in particular. Um, this afternoon we thought it was very important that we focused on this because of the number of people who died because of the catastrophic collapse. So there's clear public interest and, and Dr Sharp will take you through that. Um, I'd ask if we could hold questions to the end because there's, there's quite a bit of detail. It is complex, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to convey that in a reasonably sensible manner. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the same presentation that uh, we gave this morning to the families. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, is being done uh, in our, our Wellington office, but I can assure you that many of us are either brought up here in Christchurch or, or trained here. And in fact, my first experience of a, an interest in an earthquake was the Inango Hua earthquake on, uh, in May 1968. And uh, the important part of that was that uh, at 8 o'clock that morning we had our first scheduled lecture on uh, optional subject of earthquake engineering, which shows you where we've gone since then. Just to remind those people who, who uh, might not have seen the, uh, the building as it was before the collapse, this is the Pine Gourd Corporation building in Cambridge Terrace, uh, taking about a year before the earthquake. This presentation is going to cover uh, very simply the aspects of design and construction, reason for collapse, history of the building, our investigations and the conclusions and recommendations that we've made and all of this is within uh, the report. There's nothing here that's not within the report that's been handed out. So first of all, design and construction. 
uh, we've, uh, we've concluded that the building appears to have been designed uh, in accordance with the standards of the time, 1993, and the construction appears to have been in accordance with the design. The reasons for the collapse, well, we cut straight to this rather than being a conclusion. The main reason for the collapse is that the shaking on the 22nd of February was several times larger than what the building was designed for. And uh, the three uh, aspects of that collapse are that the east wall and the core of, uh, failed above level one, and subsequently the columns that you will have seen on the previous picture of it around the outside, uh, the perimeter of the building, could not sustain the, the horizontal movement that the core forced the rest of the building to take. And, uh, and the, finally, that the floors, uh, the connection between the floors and the walls obviously failed, as you can see from the photographs afterwards, because the displacements were just far too great uh, for the floors to hang on to the building. So just to talk about the shaking here, uh, this is a way in which we try to uh, explain uh, the shaking uh, that occurred on the 22nd of February. This is called a response spectrum and across the bottom here you will see uh, the, uh, what's the natural period of the structure. And I'll just use my little model to, to show you that every building has its own uh, natural way in which it wants to respond. And sometimes it's stiffer in one direction than another. And uh, it, the, the earthquake has its own natural frequencies, and every earthquake's different, and every direction of every earthquake, the principal direction, or, or the, the, it may have a bias in one direction, it will make the building respond in a different way depending on on uh, the characteristics, the dynamic characteristics of the building. So uh, a tall building will have a, quite a long period and a short building will have a, a short period, uh, a small period, natural period, and that's what we're showing across here. So Pine Gould Corporation has a, a first natural period of something like uh, 0.6 of a second. And so this plots how great the earthquake shaking uh, response is for lollipops like this sitting on the ground representing the buildings. And so you can see that a, a tall building uh, for most earthquakes uh, does not get a huge response and that's why something like the Christchurch uh, Women's Hospital has been put on rubber pads which take its natural period out so that it's very flexible out here and normally misses the main input from the earthquake. Uh, this very faint uh, red line that you three see through here represents uh, the design level that we were designing buildings up to last year for uh, in, in Christchurch. Uh, and this grey band through here is, is a, a band of accelerations that have been recorded at some of the, uh, at the four closest recording stations around the CBD. Uh, this uh, big heavy red line there shows you what we would expect to see exceeded about once every 2,500 years. These green lines down here are uh, an approximate way of, of representing the design uh, that was uh, the design levels that were being used in, in 1965, depending on the characteristics of the, of the building. So you could think of that as a bit of a band down here. So you can see that the shaking on the day was, uh, was extreme on, on most counts. We have another way of showing it, which is a, sort of a, a, a different sort of uh, plot where we've got displacement instead of the natural period on the bottom and uh, spectral acceleration. And then we've got the natural periods along these radial lines. So this is for a flexible building and this is for a stiff building. And down here we have the, uh, the design levels for, uh, that we would assume were used for the Pine Gould Corporation building, the 1935 code and the 1965 code. Uh, remember this building was designed in 1963 and built a couple of years later. 
so by and and the the current uh, code uh, levels if it was put on here would would be around about there so you can see at least in some of the measurements of acceleration and displacement the this, the earthquake on the february 22nd was uh, well in excess of most design levels. What it wasn't in excess was, was the duration of the sh strong shaking and we should be grateful for that. Here's the same thing for 4th of September uh, as the slide two before and you can see immediately that the, the shaking there was uh, much lower than that, that grey band is much lower than uh, I was showing before. Also remember that uh, uh, there are four uh, recording stations close to the CBD. Uh, the nearest one to the PGC building is this one up here, up, up in the north of um, in Colombo Street, and you can see about 670 metres. But you must also realise that uh, the land all around here, I'd like to describe it as being like a marbled cake, uh, because of the uh, ways in which the water has tracked, uh, the rivers have tracked and over there, over the, over the millennia. Uh, there have been deposits of material of different sorts all over that uh, and so uh, it, it's got little marbles of uh, uh, like a marbled cake of, of different soils underneath uh, any particular area and uh, we believe that um, the changes are great enough that even down one street from what you see from the buildings uh, clearly they've been receiving different uh, levels of, of shaking even down the one street. So perhaps every, you could imagine that every building is sitting on its own little bowl of jelly of different stiffness. Um, so it is um, an approximation for us to take this recordings from here and put them under the PGC building in, a, in, a now, in analysis. Uh, we don't know of uh, any way better to do that to estimate exactly what went on underneath it. So back to the first of those uh, causes uh, for the reasons, a compression or buckling failure of, uh, of the east wall of the unconfined shear core. What do we mean by buckling? Well, if you take that as a piece of wall in the building, and you push down it on it in compression, eventually something goes, and that's a buckling. Uh, it, it's a compression failure. Um, it's not always clear where, whether it first just crushes or actually buckles, but the net effect is the same. When we say shear wall, uh, we're saying that it's a wall designed to take uh, the shearing between the two floors in the building caused by the horizontal shaking of the building. So that's shearing uh, like that, and that's a shear wall designed to resist it. Thanks. And I show you that on a plan, looking down on the building at, um, at above the first floor level, and you can see a, uh, the core walls, which are around the, the lifts and the stairs, and that's common in many in many buildings, and that is the main element in this building providing the resilience to the earthquake being predominantly horizontal shaking. And you can see uh, that uh, of course uh, we're influenced by the photograph taken uh, after the earthquake which shows the main part of the, the, the core wall, you might call that the tower, staying uh, pretty much intact from the uh, first floor up. Uh, and. Uh, this is the east side over here, and it's failed between the first and the second floor. And important to that was uh, our interviewing of USAR people who went up and down those stairs a little bit, who described the inside of the, uh, the core above first level as being uh, pretty intact and not very badly damaged. You'll also notice that the, the ground floor is uh, from here down to here, is virtually undamaged and that's true and uh, when we started our investigation we looked at uh, the top of these columns you just might be able to see there and there was not even any evidence of cracking there so that ground floor was very strong and uh, that's um, quite logical when you look at the plan of between the ground floor and the first floor and you see that there are quite a few extra walls down at that level 
which more than compensate uh, down there. And so it's not surprising that uh, this was a bit of a change at the first level, and that's which the one that was critical. Now, I would say that the, the, the thing that happened after the wall uh, moved so far was that those columns around the outside that you would have seen on the first photograph were unable to take those displacements. And uh, here we have uh, a section through that outer wall. You'll see that, in fact, the outer wall was uh, cantilevered out from the ground floor. And uh, these columns between here and here and here and here uh, were not capable of being tilted over very far before they failed at the tops and bottoms. You, you also notice on there that we've stated here that after a comprehensive uh, investigation done in 1997, uh, the owners engineers recommended and they were put in place, uh, steel props were put in behind those uh, because they recognised that um, the style that, uh, of the design in, in the 60s uh, uh, was not sufficient for um, maintaining the, the vertical, uh, uh, separating, holding the loads up, separating the floors under the earthquake that they were considering. And here you see plenty of evidence of that. You can see here and here uh, the, the, the columns themselves have stayed uh, uh, reasonably in, intact, but the joints have failed. You can see that all over these places. And I think, in, in fact, you can probably see those steel props that are, were behind there. There was plenty of evidence of them around afterwards. Uh, now, here's an, an, another case um, where uh, now, if we were designing that now, we would bind up the uh, bottoms of the columns and within the joint with reinforcing so that even though it got craunched around, it wouldn't catastrophically fail. So uh, uh, that would give you some hope that even if you got far bigger displacements, horizontal displacements to the building than you'd expected, there might be still some residual propping action of those to stop the floors pancaking together. Here's another a clear example of where uh, the, the joint fell apart because of the huge uh, deformations that it was trying to carry. And the, uh, the floor connection to the wall, well that's a consequence uh, of the, the building going far further than it was ever contemplated in the original design because the original design would not uh, um, uh, contemplate the situation when the loads were exceeded by such a margin. And uh, if you see from these photographs uh, along here, you can see evidence of uh, bars that were coming out from the wall uh, within the slab have, have snapped off. The, uh, the stretching of the rods in tension has been great enough that they have uh, simply snapped. And there's another close-up of the same thing. You can see the ends of the bar there. So that's <coughs> under understandable. Uh, because the, uh, the building lurched eventually to, towards New Brighton, towards the, the east, uh, it, it pushed up against some of these floors, even though the, the top floor actually broke away and slid down onto the building next door. Uh, this was fortuitous that these ones on this side didn't actually break and of course provided uh, 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 some space, uh, and I don't know the details of uh, how many people were in there, but uh, that, that sort of behaviour would certainly uh, have helped survival of people. So our investigations began in, in April, uh, when the building had already been demolished down to uh, the, the first floor level. Uh, we we had uh, we've been able to get uh, what we believe is all the documentation that we would need from uh, Christchurch City Council files, from the owners, structural engineers files, which go uh, back a long way. Uh, we have the original drawings for construction of the structure, and we, of course we have many photographs taken mainly after it. And uh, part of our brief was to to interview witnesses uh, who, who say that they saw the building collapse or had something else to tell us about that. Material tests were undertaken by uh, uh, another consultant uh, soon after the collapse, before we started, 
And when we started, we realised we didn't and, and began to see that the wall might be uh, the prime uh, collapse place. Uh, we went uh, out to the Burwood uh, landfill where they've uh, sequestered all the, all the material and we were able to locate uh, a number of pieces of the wall which we located because of, we knew the dimensions, the thickness of the concrete and the layout of the steel. And we took additional samples then of the concrete from those and the steel and had them tested and uh, that we were able to rule out the materials uh, uh, being a, a specific uh, uh, factor in the, in the collapse. They all came up to, to levels which were, were consistent with the uh, design requirements. The earthquake records, of course, we get from the GNS Science database, which is uh, publicly available. And uh, then we undertook a simulation of the building uh, using uh, a com computer analysis and the particular form that we use is uh, called nonlinear time history analysis which is uh, uh, something we've been doing for 40 years, my long suit, uh, where we actually uh, mathematically input the earthquake records, the actual ones, into to an idealised mathematical model of the building and we actually track it as, as the forces are exceeded within it and when it starts to uh, break up for uh, a certain degree. We can't actually simulate the complete collapse, but we can certainly see where, the, 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 where it's happening. So the history of the building, this is in the, in the report, 1963 designed, uh, built about uh, 1966, uh, handed over to the City Council when the drainage board went out of uh, existence, uh, sold in 1997 to, to uh, um, Pine Gourd Corporation and uh, at that time with a refurbishment in order they did uh, had their engineers do a comprehensive uh, assessment of the structural stability of the building and that's where those additions of the props came. Uh, the building was then sold to a, a private investor in, in 2008. Uh, there was in 2009 some repairs made to some cor corrosion uh, induced uh, bursting of the outside concrete on the columns which uh, uh, we don't think has anything to do with uh, uh, the collapse of the building. Um, and we also have uh, the the uh, engineer who assessed the building, uh, his reports after the September and uh, Boxing Day earthquakes. We've uh, been able to track through the documentation when bits and pieces were added or subtracted. Uh, there were some stairs taken out, some of the uh, doorways in the in the uh, core walls uh, were, were either filled in or recreated and strengthening put around those as necessary. And here's just another uh, shot of the same thing. You might remember that this building used to have some concrete umbrellas in the top and they were taken off as part of that earlier refurbishment uh, for safety reasons. So here's um, just a shot from partway through our simulation of the earthquake and uh, the little red dots show where uh, things are starting to graunch. Uh, gone past the point of no return and that there will be permanent damage in those points. Uh, and you can see the, that's another shot from later on the building going back the other way. And uh, with uh, the crunching uh, and collapse of the wall starting to happen down here between the first and the second floor. It's important to, to appreciate that um, when we design a building, uh, we don't always, uh, for very high loads, we don't, uh, we don't expect it to stay perfect, we expect it to, to be damaged. And uh, depending on the severity, that damage might be uh, up towards the design level such that if we focus on life safety that the people are safe, uh, but um, the building could well be uh, an economic write-off. And this is represented here by this, if you push something and measure the displacement as you push it, it stays elastic, so if you take the load off it goes back to where it was. But we allow buildings to go into the part where, where under very extreme, close to design levels, the bits are getting graunched around. Um, but we don't, um, so the design level might be in here somewhere, 
we're allowed to get up to here. We don't want it to go on to the point where it is so munted that uh, it, it actually breaks apart. Like if you take a piece of wire and, and fatigue it enough, it will, will break. Well, even reinforced concrete acts like that. Of course, the, the records, we have digital versions of these, and it's worth looking and seeing. You can see from these, which are in the report, the difference of the characteristics. But I understand that a, an engineer in designing a building doesn't know anything about the earthquake in, in specific terms. He doesn't know about any directionality, uh, the frequency content. He has some idea of that, and that's codified. But on the day, uh, you can get them of short, long durations and, and, and different frequency contents. And that's true of the three earthquakes that, uh, that uh, we've looked at there. This is the February one, and you can see uh, up the, any of them to really show you uh, in different different components, uh, uh, east, west, uh, north, south, and, and up and down the characteristics. This is what we concluded um, was the sequence of events. Uh, that Remember our time zero starts when the, the earthquake record starts. It might, not be, it might be a little bit before people start to feel it. Uh, but we think that the ground motion went to towards uh, whoops, the wrong button towards uh, New Brighton, and then uh, it, and it caused it to uh, the building to resist and go back a bit. It may have actually stretched the wall there a little bit. It could have even broken some of the steel in the wall there. We don't think that's important. And then there was a uh, a uh, lurch to the uh, to the right here. And, and eventually we think that that's the sequence. Now we're not quite sure. Our, our simulation shows that, it, that um, it was well on the way to collapse at around a, something after five and a half, six seconds, but uh, our analysis can't take us through the, through the last part. Witnesses that we've um, recorded uh, interviews with give quite varying times on, on that sequence. Uh, interesting, even people standing together have given us uh, different reports on that, so we can't be quite sure on what's happened there. Other conclusions, the, uh, if there was a fracture of the tension and stretching of that wall just before it failed in compression, uh, we don't think that that itself was significant in that um, if you allow something to rock like that, in fact, there's a bridge in the North Island that is designed, a railway bridge designed to do just that, it actually relieves the the forces on the building. <laughs> it might not be good for the insurance company, but it's actually quite good for the survival of the building. And we've c uh, concluded also that those perimeter columns, if that wall hadn't failed, they were probably adequate to keep the floors apart up to the point where the wall uh, was clearly going to fail. So was there any warning of collapse uh, after the previous earthquakes? We reviewed the information, we've reviewed the consultants' uh, site inspection reports and um, we've concluded that there were no signs that the building had been significantly uh, distressed in those uh, first two earthquakes that uh, brought upon the collapse, the, uh, the uh, eventual collapse. We, we have photographs taken of uh, cracks uh, that were recorded by the engineers. You have to, have to appreciate that um, uh, an engineer might see a crack somewhat differently to uh, uh, a member of the public in that um, many cracks uh, occur, and I know I've seen them in this building, uh, occur just in the jib board because of very slight movement which we would expect and the joints are very weak and so, so uh, there are joints and there are joints. And these ones are in the wall and uh, uh, we've concluded that the engineers were reasonable in their, their uh, assumption that the, uh, or, or their conclusion that these were not uh, detrimental to the earthquake, um, continued earthquake capacity of the building. So other factors which may, uh, have, con may have been considered uh, the ground conditions, we did um, extra testing in the foundations after the building was demolished and we found no evidence that the ground uh, by way of uh, slumping or differential movement or liquefaction
played any part in the uh, actual uh, collapse of this building. Uh, as I've said before, we don't think that previous damage was part of it. Uh, in fact, the vertical accelerations which we did model in our um, analyses, uh, we don't think in particular the high level of vertical accelerations was particularly important. You have to understand that uh, uh, buildings are designed for their weight, which is a vertical gravity, is a vertical acceleration, and so they're already quite resilient to vertical accelerations, except for cantilevers uh, like wings that go out the side, they can get flapped up and down a bit more, but that wasn't the case here. Uh, and we've concluded that the modifications to the building structure uh, and, and the additional opening in the shear core made in 1998 didn't uh, themselves play a part in it. So recommendations, our main recommendations are saying that the People doing assessments and the, and the territorial authorities should uh, make sure that attention is paid on looking for critical uh, structural weaknesses in buildings, which might not be first uh, apparent. It's like an Achilles heel of the building. Uh, if the Achilles heel point fails in the building, uh, particularly older buildings uh, may have no secondary way of, uh, of standing up. Like, other parts can't hold hands, so to speak, and, uh, and survive for a life safety so that they don't collapse. So uh, there are bound to be other buildings uh, that around which are of similar sort, so that we're saying that the assessment guidelines which we have, which the New Zealand Society of Earthquake Engineering uh, produced uh, some years ago, a uh, very thorough uh, assessment of buildings should bring out this point a bit more. Um, and we, we realise, as with some of the other information that we know about uh, buildings in Christchurch, that, that uh, these buildings which have walls that are quite lightly reinforced, although complying with the codes at the time, um, are particularly uh, susceptible to very high axial loads. And uh, I think there's some lessons for us to be learnt there. So that's my presentation.